This podcast focuses on regulatory and corporate developments in highly regulated spaces. I'm Christian Bax, and I used to regulate medical marijuana. I'm Tony Glover, and I used to regulate alcoholic beverages, casino gaming, and tobacco. Now together, we're regulated. Welcome back to Regulated. This is Tony Glover. Of course, I'm joined by Christian Bax. Christian, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. All all things considered, how about yourself? I'm doing okay. You know, we're hitting two months of, of quarantine, so, you know... The daddy daycare situation is getting a little tough, but I want to check in on you. What happened to you this morning? What's what's going on with you? <laughs> so the power the power in Tallahassee is is finicky to begin with, but for for some reason our our pod got delayed this morning because I I woke up and set up as our you know we typically do our our setup and. Uh, I start to freak out a little bit because I I have no Wi-Fi, so I'm I'm making sure that the Wi-Fi bill is paid, that the Xfinity gods have been appeased, and then <laughs> I I so I go over to the router and like there's no lights on, and I, I I I have this epiphany after literally working on this problem for 20 minutes that um nothing is on there I I have had no power the entire time I've been trying to figure out why the Wi-Fi is not working. <laughs> So that's that's pretty much what's become of um, of my life and and my brain since COVID nineteen has kind of taken over all of our lives. Yeah, well, this is a man who's dedicated to client work. <laughs> he didn't even notice that your power was off. So I well, appreciate that. So the thing is, is I was up and I was doing you know phone calls and I was actually right. So I was doing show prep on a Word doc. So I was like writing out the the script for what I wanted to to touch on. So it was like I didn't I think I I think when I started the power was still on and there was Wi-Fi because I couldn't have kind of started the things and pulled up the news articles. So at some point in the transition the power died and I was just so out of it. Yeah, I didn't even notice. But to not not to too sharp of a transition. Can I tell you about the most first world stupid COVID injury, uh, I think anybody has had that I've, I've heard of that. Uh, that yeah, I, I, I want to hear what this is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is, this is a, a conglomeration of like multiple first world issues into a perfect first world injury. So I had a day about six or seven days ago where it was basically like I was completely sedentary. So I was, I was working and then went from working into like watching Bulls documentary on ESPN into into watching terrible like my six hundred pound life. And anyway, so I was on my butt the whole day. And I I had conversely I had bought a week before this this wrist strap thing that's just called a Whoop. And Whoop is like all of the best parts of the fitness part of the Apple Watch without kind of the the timekeeping component or any of the other functional things. So it's just kind of a strap you wear on your wrist to monitor it. How well you're sleeping, your your heart rate, all that kind of stuff. So I get up and it's about midnight and my wrist hurts. And so I I take off my uh my whoop because it, it hurts right where where my whoop is. And then I notice that like where my whoop used to be, there's this huge indented band around my wrist. And at that point, Again, I, 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 if you're observing a, a theme here, it's that I'm I'm a little been a little bit slow on the uptake of noticing things. So I <laughs> I notice I look a little bit more. My hand looks like it got stung by a bee. Like it is twice as big as my left hand, and so it's like this huge marshmallowy version of my right hand, which I just didn't notice happening. And so like I I thought. I don't know how this happened, but like I have this fear, you know, I'm by myself and I've basically given myself a blood clot in my (laughs) right arm from my whoop and just from like playing video games and playing on my computer and like doing work. And so like I literally, I swear to God, I literally took a piece of paper and wrote a note and left it on my kitchen counter. It's basically like I'm going to bed by myself. If anybody like finds me and something has gone horribly wrong. I gave myself a blood clot with my whoop and that's what happened. That's why I'm no longer with us. So uh, nothing happened though. I think I think it was just, you know, the blood, you, I was using my hand and so the blood went down into my hand and the whoop wouldn't let it out, creating this vicious whoop circle of uh, inflammation. So is this the right time for a whoop there it is joke or not? <laughs> 
I was waiting the entire time for that one. So. <laughs> That's a better response than literally anybody I've told that story to. I mean, just off the cuff, that was better than than any. But like, I had this. Uh, it's hard to explain without kind of being in the moment. But this kind of visceral fear where it's like midnight. I don't want to. I don't want to like embarrass myself in front of my family. But I also had this non-zero probability of of fearing going to bed and literally dying of laziness and whoop. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're in this high stakes moment, right? Where, you know, I stop playing basketball because I don't want to break my ankle or, or hurt my shoulder and, and have something I need to go to the hospital for. So I'm doing the most careful jogs you've ever seen, hopping over stones and, and sticks and, and avoiding everything. I told my daughter that, you know, we need to be careful with our household electronics. We, you know, we broke my tablet last week. I told her, I was like, we're, I'm not buying anything. <laughs> I'm not replacing anything. We're not going to Costco. If that TV falls off the entertainment system and cracks, we're just going to have to you know, tell camp stories for the rest of the year. So we're in this precarious position, but we'll get through it. Well, moving on from whoop, there it is jokes to something else that's equally as current and exciting. <laughs> Christian has a litigation story for us. What's going on? <laughs> You know, uh, there wasn't just one story that was that was interesting to me. It was it was more a, a cluster. And so there are a lot of stories that are basically the same, talking about this the same kind of database of information. The one I'm looking at right now is by uh, Shana Jacobs from the Washington Post. There's a, this database that a law firm called Hunt and Andrews and Kurth has put together, and it. As of Friday, there were 771 lawsuits on that database that have been filed against businesses regarding uh, response to COVID-19. So this includes hospitals, senior living facilities, airlines, cruise lines, fitness chains, movie theaters, entertainment industry, ticket companies like uh, StubHub and Ticketmaster. And the point is, is that almost every element of consumer-facing businesses are now subject to litigation. And this huge cluster coming from trial attorneys that have all pivoted and they're like, okay, well, the economy has shut down. People have limited their face-to-face -face interactions for the last two months. And so this thing is now, for better or for worse, where trial attorneys have kind of turned their attention, which we've been predicting for two months, obviously. And they're, they're in different categories, right? So when when people, I think, read these articles, because I did too, you walk into a certain assumption, which is that th these would be basically negligence lawsuits or lawsuits seeking damages resulting from someone actually getting COVID-19, which, which is some of them, right? So there are some lawsuits regarding family members or people themselves who got sick on cruise lines or who got right. sick in elderly care facilities. But a lot of these are purely economic. One, one in particular that they, they cite is a yoga studio in California that's being sued right now by customers. And it's not because they went in there, they went into hot yoga and they came out and they had this you know viral pneumonia. It's that they, they have this monthly subscription model where they're being charged every month and this business doesn't have the cash on hand to refund a month or two back from when they, they basically had to shut these things down. And these customers are continuing to be billed because 24-hour fitness model, the gold gym fitness model, which a lot of these studio fitness models and CrossFits across the country follow, is a, a subscription base where they're just getting you every month. And uh, you know, obviously not 100% of clients are using the facility, but that, that's revenue that's coming in every month to these businesses. And there's not really a mechanism because those that money comes in and pays things like rent and coaches and for like facilities and equipment. And so like it's not really equipped financially to be able to claw back two months worth of revenue and give it back to customers. And so you're seeing litigation, class actions about this, like this very fundamental issue of what happens when a business is forced to shut down for two months and right. everyone in that business is asking for their money back at the same time. I mean, there's so many different angles that there's going to be litigation on. I mean, I think immediately of the insurance issue and people are going to be denied insurance benefits on the basis of shutdowns. Of course, if you've ever been a member of a gym, and have tried to cancel for any reason, you know how difficult that process can be. So I'm sure it's not easier right now trying to cancel a gym membership because of the coronavirus. So yeah, there's going to continue to be litigation. 
And, you know, there's discussions federally about immunities for certain type of um, litigation. I think that's more focused on, on what you referenced earlier, the employee that gets sick, more of that angle, which I, I think there may be an evidentiary problem with that, too. You know, with, with contract tracing being what it is, right. it may be difficult to tell where you contracted the, the virus with any specificity. But it's, it's definitely a tough question. I don't think there's any easy, easy answers to it right now. You could very well have a different standard for these personal injury lawsuits in California than you do in Florida or you do in Montana. And you're actually seeing that now is that, you know, when you start getting in the weeds as far as people who are writing at a little bit higher level legally, they're pointing out California is kind of a choice venue now for these lawsuits, especially if you're going after a national or an international company with with uh, economic ties to the U.S. is they're going after them in uh, the Ninth Circuit and in right. um, California specifically because the the consumer protection laws are so much broader. <laughs> I, I would say generously broader is uh, it's also easier for you to get groups of people to to kind of coalesce and yes. sue for a bunch of uh, small damages in the form of a class action. One of the one of the economic ones that that's really interesting is is StubHub. Ticketmaster has been in a, 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 a similar situation um, through Live Nation, and, and basically the the premise of the whole problem is that these things are are basically pass throughs, right? So they're they are a conduit to buy tickets. And how it normally works, according to them, because they're the defendants in these cases, is that so say that you were, you know, you're you're looking to buy an Ariana Grande concert ticket, right? And you you bought this thing, and the event downstream shuts down, right? And so what what these ticket companies are saying is normally how that would work is almost like a pass through liability. So they're they're saying, okay, this thing has shut down, and so the the vendor is going to reimburse us and then we are going to reimburse you. That entire system has completely collapsed because you have thousands of events that were all shut down at the same time. These venues don't have any money to pay the middlemen and these middlemen have no money to pay the consumers. And so you have like this death by 10 million cuts because you have all of these people all over the country who maybe got hit for a couple hundred dollars, maybe up to low, very low thousands of dollars for these concert tickets. But it, it was it was such a broad problem that th we're talking about tens of millions of dollars here that lawyers are basically going after these guys for. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of what happened in 2008 with you know, mortgage securities, where basically you had this fundamental shock to the system that that created this cascade where it's like nobody had nobody had the the finance nobody had the cash on hand to actually like stop the bleeding and so it just cascaded all the way down to the base level consumer. So what do you think is going to happen? I mean, is there is there some sort of broad solution that you see here, or you know how how do you how do you feel about the state of litigation in a coronavirus environment? It's it's tough because. I would say that the red-blooded American freedom-loving person in me is that, you know, sometimes when you exist in an economy, bad stuff happens and you take a risk and you have to wear it, right? And so um, I tend to lean towards the fact that this is kind of a force majeure, that there this this is as close to an act of God as you can get with this broad of a scope. And so that fundamentally the the consumer, you know, this is one of those sad situations where the consumers just kind of got to eat it. Like they wanted to go to this concert. It's not like the, the guy got sick, like the, their respective government shut that concert down. The problem is, is I think that this was a, they're maybe not bad actors, but kind of negligently acting where there doesn't seem to have been like reserves, like any kind of reserve. So these things were just basically passing through this money without, without actually actively taking you know, like like a bank, a bank is forced to keep cash reserves as a certain percentage of what its overall holdings are. So the people's money doesn't just purely exist on paper. There is some money. So there's if there's a small to moderate run on the bank. There, there's enough cash for that bank not to go insolvent, and those returns are insured. There seems to be in these situations, specifically with these gym memberships, and then with these ticket company pass throughs. There's, there's there's no like fundamental cash reserve that was required of these companies. And these reserves weren't required to be insured 
And so moving forward, there's there may be some consumer protection legislation that requires companies operating in certain states to keep those type of reserves or keep insurance. But this may be one of those situations where people are just kind of stuck unless they want to litigate for the next five years, you know, to get their their hundred and twenty dollar Ariana Grande ticket refunded. Well, if not Professor Christ, maybe we need to have another law professor on to discuss sort of what he or she is seeing in this area, because there's there's definitely discussions happening right now. I don't think we know what the Republican plan in the U.S. Senate is going to be to deal with some of the immunity issues. And we don't know how widespread it could be, right? It could end up touching some of these consumer protection things, some of the ancillary issues that you've mentioned as well. So it'll be interesting to see. So let's maybe when we get offline, we'll talk about some ideas to probe this subject a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that they're going to have to, that's going to be needed because you've got lawyers right now, but part of this article and some of the law review articles I read on that, they, they feature these these recent call to actions where personal injury lawyers are out there calling on potential clients who are in, you know, the essential jobs you know, that's grocery store personnel, delivery drivers, bus operators. And they're, they're saying, come to us with your, your stories and your lack of personal protection equipment and, and let's, let's litigate. And so you have this situation where it's like you, I, I want so badly for people who are bad actors to have to compensate people who were harmless victims. But at the same time, like some of this stuff makes my skin crawl a little bit because it's very obvious this is kind of their quick buck that they're looking for. So they're basically like going to slap as many, many perfectly innocent small businesses with as many lawsuits as possible and settle these things out and to just kind of get this quick windfall that, you know, a lot of those people aren't even going to see because they, they go to the lawyers anyway. Well, I think we know you stand on tort reform. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you, I think I think people who are doing bad things should definitely be punished. But when you, it's just so brazenly, you know, you're out there searching for people to either, I don't know, it, it just, it the way that this, some of this stuff is being framed, it, it does bother me a little bit. I mean, how, how do you feel about that? About kind of like, where does the, that burden lie when the, the entire society goes through something at the same time, like when it's really nobody's fault. Right. Well, I'm torn on it. And you know, professionally, when I was a litigator, I was a civil defense litigator, generally for large businesses, right? So professionally, that's my background. But I do think that plaintiffs lawyers and plaintiffs play an important role during a crisis like this, because in the absence of a specific government regulation, sort of the threat of litigation, plaintiffs lawsuits, keep some of these businesses honest. It, it makes them step up their game, use precautions. But of course, what you're talking about is something a little bit different. But in terms of exposure, I think that the lurking plaintiff's firm, the John Morgans of the world, right? They're, they're causing supermarket chains and restaurants to, to be additionally careful above and beyond what, whatever the guideline is from your mayor, your governor, or your president. You know, smart chains are also thinking about the litigation risk. I guarantee you, in-house litigation counsel has been involved in those discussions when they're when they're coming up with their their safety mechanisms. So I'm I'm torn. I, I don't have a clear cut position on it. I think both sides, you know, have important perspectives. And frankly, I, I'm not going to be able to judge whether we got this one right until probably we get a little bit deeper into it. To, to their credit, I haven't heard any personal injury advertisements on the radio, not to say that they don't exist, but like that law firm that you mentioned, like I haven't, I haven't heard advertisements or seen advertisements for them seeking clients yet up, up to this point. Here's the play. Here's the play now. And there's another, I think Orlando based large plaintiffs firm that has deployed this. They're doing nice advertisements right now. They've shifted their budget to thanking first responders to giving credit. Hold on a second. Well, before we were interrupted, I don't remember what, what we were saying either, but I, I do want to remark just in the couple of weeks that we've been recording, you know, my daughter's approach to interrupting the podcast has gotten so sophisticated. So uh, if you've been listening, you probably heard her in the background in different recordings. You certainly heard her bum rush the microphone in one, one yeah. particular episode <laughs> where she was basically at the third mic for, for a few minutes at the end of the episode. But now she's really stepped up her game. She's basically running a protection racket in my home office where she comes up quietly and taps me and basically like, you know, hey, this is a nice podcast you got here. Can I have a cookie? <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so she's come up, and I think a couple times you didn't even notice. She came up and and tapped me and whispered cookie, and she's gotten three little Debbie cookies out of me and a tall glass of milk. So I don't know what's next. Next, she's gonna make me sign over my car and burn down my restaurant. I don't know what's. I don't know where we're going with this. <laughs> That's great. So there is one interesting thing to your point about personal injury firms keeping low profile. There's one thing I've seen on social media that they're kind of they've kind of transitioned to playing Mr. Nice Guy right now. So what they're doing is thanking first responders, um, thanking people on the front lines. They're engaging celebrities. I think uh, I saw Flow Rider in an ad recently on Twitter, and it's all nice guy stuff. But look, I bet you their marketing budget has stayed static. They haven't cut down on their marketing during this time period. It's important for them to continue maintaining awareness, seeming like good people. And when they need to flip that switch to start uh, soliciting cases, whether it's a class action or individual matters, they're going to be ready to do it. And I bet you they already have the copy written and the ads recorded. So we'll see it. (laughs) And you're hitting on something that's actually, it's so funny you bring this up because this has been a pet peeve of mine. I would love to see the budget on some of these companies for their marketing specs, but specifically the marketing and the ad spend for advertising what their charitable contributions have been. So because nothing's really happening, right? You you have a lot of big companies that have traditional, traditionally large ad budgets right now that are basically, for lack of a better word, putting forward ads that are self-congratulatory. <laughs> the most, the most, like for whatever reason, the one that sticks in my head, there's a, there's a beer company there's that, that you may, you, you have seen their commercials and it's congratulating themselves for donating a hundred thousand dollars to first responders. Right. But this, this thing is on all the time. It's on everywhere. There's no way, there's absolutely no way they spent less than a hundred thousand dollars on their ad spend for their charitable contributions. And it, it's it's kind of like, I know this is cynical, but if you if these companies took the amount of money that they put into bragging about how much they donated and actually just donated it, didn't say anything about it, the the immense amount of societal impact that that would have would dwarf what they're what they're just kind of <laughs> like kind of drip dropping into these funds. I mean, we're talking tens of millions of dollars versus these like hundred thousand dollar donations. So it's like, man, I, it's, it's just crazy because last month I've seen the same company bragging about a hundred thousand dollars. When I've like, hey man, every Office episode I've seen on Comedy Central for the you know since March has had your commercial on it, and. <laughs> I know that's not cheap right now. <laughs> well, somebody had I don't a, know, a man. tweet, and I, I wish I could remember who it was because I would shout them out now, but they had a tweet about the same sort of commercial, and they said <laughs> the tagline, they, I mean, they made this up, but the tagline was, in this uncertain time, it's more important than ever to live Moss. <laughs> the nice. Taco Bell slogan. <laughs> so yeah, everybody's everybody's going for it. Uh, I saw one. I, I I think my favorite tweet. I can't remember who did it, but it was it was like a famous person that I, the, the somebody retweeted. But it was basically like, oh, I knew it was. It was Chrissy Teigen. Chrissy Teigen, who I am like not. I don't know, I'm I'm I don't follow her on Twitter, but I saw her. Somebody retweeted that she was basically like, "Are we living in uncertain times right now?" Are things going to get better if we all stick together? I need someone to tweet and tell me because it's like the most <laughs> mundane, mundane, um, repeated, just kind of uh, maxims that are that are going on right now. But I, I don't. Let's let's get away from that rant because they they still are donating. That's better than nothing. Um, even it's if they're than patting themselves on the back. Okay, Tony. I know you have you have a quick hit, a story that you're interested in. So let's get into that. Yeah, I'm just going to read the first paragraph for you and get your reaction, because if I don't get off this podcast, my daughter is going to, like I said, she's going to own my car (laughs) and take over my take over my law firm. So this is from The Telegraph over in England. It just came out today, May 5th, as we record this. And I'm going to skip the headline and just read the first paragraph. The scientist whose advice prompted Prime Minister Boris Johnson to lock down Britain resigned from his government advisory position on Tuesday night as the Telegraph can reveal that he broke social distancing rules to meet his married lover. Nice. 
Professor Neil Ferguson allowed the woman to visit him at home during the lockdown while lecturing the public on the need for strict social distancing in order to reduce the spread of the coronavirus. The woman lives with her husband and their children in another house. And I'm glad that they clarified that it is in another house and that they're not going back to I'm glad they clarified that he didn't resign, you know, as as the most, you know, one of the most common reasons for resignations like this was because of infidelity becoming public and it's politically not tenuous. But it's like, no, it's more than that. It's well, you know, sometimes, sometimes she could people have been say, a carrier of a virus. <laughs> well, sometimes people say I'm resigning to spend more time with my family. He may be resigning to spend more time with her family. <laughs> other family. Yeah. I mean, so like so if you think about it. It is super hypocritical, but beyond that, Boris has had a rough time with COVID. He's he's probably especially is uh, sensitive to that right now. And you, if if the goal is to keep your this inner core of government in the UK functioning without having another Boris Johnson incident where he's in the emergency room fighting for his life. It's just like, come on, man, you're, you're part of a team here. Well, look, the, the reality, the reality of the situation is, and I have some colorful examples I could give you from my own Twitter and, and Facebook feed. Single people are going crazy right now. <laughs> the people are going stir crazy. Um, As a single I'm, person, I can attest to this. That what you're saying is true. I mean, I'm hearing just, uh, I, I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> So I'm, I'll I'm tell you, seeing things. <laughs> I'll tell you as a single as a single man who is who is is going through two months as gracefully as possible within you know isolation and COVID. I have never been working. I've never worked out so hard, so consistently in my entire life because I, I'm waiting for that day when things open up and it's. I, I think that that it will be like a dating scene, like we we haven't seen in what 70 years <laughs> because it's just like <laughs> the, the the cultural release of it just kind of being over and being able to go out and socialize and have a beer with other people again i think will be unrivaled at least in our lifetimes and so i'm i'm just kind of every day prepping with that and that thought is what's getting me through the last two months <laughs> well on that note i think it's time for us to wrap up you know prayers okay. up to all the single people out there who are locked down you know I, I, and the people who are i mean candidly and the people who are having actual real problems that that neither you nor right. i have described <laughs> we don't mean to make light of this but i would say in my own defense and and uh, speaking for tony is quarantine is making everyone a little bit crazy so if you are for some reason offended by us talking about the minutia of our of living through quarantine, just understand. We understand the macro problems. We do. Oh, but we're well, making if, light if of anybody, our situation. If it's the only way to get well, through well, it. If anybody's really offended, tell them to call me in my office. I can tell them what percentage of my clients are shut down <laughs> and not answering my phone hey, calls right yeah. now. <laughs> Amen, man. Amen. So, all right, well, thanks for joining us this week on Regulated. We'll be back uh, more or less on a weekly basis going forward. Follow us on Twitter at Regulated Pod. If you search around on YouTube, we've got content, content up there as well. And of course, if you go to at Regulated Pod on Twitter or regulatedpod.com, you can find our contact information. Christian, do you want to send us out? As always, ladies and gentlemen, stay compliant.